Welcome everyone. I'm Ira Feldman and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is the Known Good Die panel discussion hosted by MEPTEC and IMAPS. Our theme is Who Cares About Known Good Die? Heterogeneous Integration is Where the Action Is. So welcome. Uh, this uh, webinar will be available uh, to watch on the MEPTEC YouTube channel uh, after uh, this event, uh, probably in a few days, it'll be posted. We'll let everybody know. But we're intending that this will be a very interactive discussion between the panelists and with the audience. Before we start, I'd like to announce a few upcoming events. The uh, MEPTEC IMAPS Semiconductor Industry Speaker Series continues with uh, St Stefan Rothrock from AT Reg tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Pacific. He's going to talk about the U.S.-China trade war and the tariff effects on the global OSAT market. If you're interested in attending this free uh, webinar, please go to meptech.org, M-E-P-T-E-C.org, and you'll find the registration link there. Uh, on July 15th, we're also excited to have Jan Vardaman from Tech Search International, who will give us a global market update and her uh, very colorful insights into what's happening in the semiconductor industry. And then we will also have another speaker series on August 12th. We'll um, announce the presenter as soon as that's confirmed. So please uh, join us for these free webinars. And then on the topic of known good dye, the 21st uh, edition of the known good dye workshop is currently scheduled for Wednesday, September 16th at semi headquarters in Milpitas, California, here in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're working towards this date, but if things change, as with everything going on right now, we will certainly let people know. We're excited that we have the David Greenlaw from NVIDIA as the keynote speaker and technical presentations from companies such as Cisco, Adventist, Synopsis, Mulbauer, AMD, Form Factor, and others. You can see up-to-date information on kgdworkshop.org, and we will also send out emails with more information as we get closer to the event. So we're looking forward to that too. So today, uh, we're very excited to have a really diverse panel with, I know um, many of the people are very outspoken and opinionated, so this should be a lively discussion. and. Uh, most of the presenters or panelists I've known for quite a while, long time now, so it's a great pleasure to have everybody in the same virtual room. Um, so we have Mike Alfano. He's a fellow in advanced packaging at AMD who's worked on multiple generations of multi-die integrated products, and he's worked in all different areas involved in shipping new products, including burn-in, ATE, S system level test, product de definition, power performance, and yield improvement. Um, Mike, you want to wave? Yeah, so there's Mike. And, and uh, Dave, you want to wave? Dave Armstrong and uh, <clears throat> is Director of Business Development at, at Advantest, and he works with the customers and their global R&D teams around the world to figure out how to solve their most demanding test challenges. Another key hat that Dave wears is he's the chair of the test working group of the Heterogeneous Integration Roadmap, which is a very productive endeavor and it's a very important to continue to roadmap throughout the industry. So I very much appreciate his efforts there. Um, Li Hong, Li Hong Kao, is a director at ASE Group responsible for the development of new packaging technology such as 2.5D, 3D, fan out wafer level packaging, uh, chip on substrate, POP, system and package, and a few other acronyms. <laughs> well, we won't list them all, but she's currently focused at looking at um, solutions for high performance computing and AI and machine intelligence applications. And prior to ASC, uh, she was also at AMD. So welcome, Li Hong. Um, Phil Nye um, joins us. Uh, 
he's currently at Broadcom, but he has a very extensive career throughout the industry um, where, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he's previously worked at IBM Global Foundries and is very well known in the industry for being outspoken. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give him the default disclaimer that his opinions are his own. <laughs> so, but uh, Phil, welcome. And then uh, Sabu, um, Sabu, Professor Sabu Ayer is the distinguished professor at both the electrical engineering department and the material science and engineering department at the University of California, Los Angeles. And he is also the director of the Center for Heterogeneous Integration and Performance Scaling, otherwise known as the CHIPS Project. So Sabu, welcome. Okay, and then, um, then we also have uh, Bob Patty. Bob, you wanna wave? So we got Bob, he's currently the president of Enhanced Semiconductors and he's worked on multiple different generations and uh, architectures, both at Enhanced and elsewhere, working on cutting edge 2.5D and 3D integration technology for a variety of applications. Uh, he was also previously the CTO of Tezeron, so a very challenging 3D system, and I'm sure we'll touch on some of the lessons you learned there. And then myself, uh, I'm once again Ira Feldman. I'm the principal consultant at Feldman Engineering. We focus on technical marketing for high technology. I'm also the executive director of MEPTEC and the general chair of TestConnex. So uh, I welcome everybody. Um, that is all we have in the way of prepared remarks, and uh, we want to uh, just jump right into the discussion. Uh, we have a healthy audience of about 150 people online right now, so I would like to ask that you use the Q&A tool. You'll see a Q&A window uh, pop up, and you can ask your questions uh, there. Um, and I will ask the panel as we go, but I'll uh, start with some questions of, uh, that we've, I have already made, but uh, we want your, your questions to make this as interactive as possible. So please uh, use the Q&A tool. So let, 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 let's start with a, a simple question and uh, you guys can take this in any order you want. But what does known good die, the concept of known good die, mean to you? Um, how about Phil? You want to lead that off? Sure, because actually it's, it's, I find this interesting. I, I don't really care what you call it. You know, there's various names for it. I don't care. I only care about one thing. If I buy bear die, how much fallout should I expect to see at the next level of assembly? Both time zero and reliability. And if somebody says the time zero fallout is zero, it's perfect, I probably won't believe them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so my answer is just give me a number. But if, if and I'll just pick on that before we go any further, but if it's uh, 70, uh, let's say your fallout's 30% or you yield 70%, you're going to survive when you get six chips in a system? No, no, we can get into more in that later. I mean, the number's got to be low. But <laughs> at least give me a number. You but know, not zero. It, it, yeah, that, and it should be, you know, parts per million. You know, it might be 10, might be 50, might be 100. Just give me a, give me a number and then do your best to stand behind it. Bob, you want to chime in next? Sure. Yeah. To, to me, it's, it, it's no not bad guy. Um, the, there are a lot of limitations on what fundamentally makes up a known good die. You know, at, at speed testing is probably a non-starter for a lot of die these days. Um, there's interactions in a lot of assemblies we do where we have IO counts that are measured in the thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes in the millions. So you 
couldn't possibly know that it know that it's a known good dye, but you can certainly ascertain that it's known not bad. Um, you know, as far as the the yield that comes out of it, um, you know, I I would love to have yield numbers. Usually, we don't uh, have those. We we tend to do low and medium volume, and that means that the customers don't know what they don't know. Um, so uh, I, I wish I had the data that they were giving Phil, but generally speaking, um, we try to work with the customers to do a lot of repair redundancy. You know, I I believe that the right long-term answers as we start assembling more and more of the chip lit kind of components with high IO counts is you you plan for failure and you uh, you use no not bad die as the starting point but you you have to be able to take a certain number of hits um, and still produce a uh, a product that is sellable at the end of the process. Um, post uh, assembly repair and test or uh, repair I should say is is key to being successful in this next generation of electronic systems. Mike you want to chime in? Yeah uh, Bob, Bob hit on it right at the end and, and the, the key word there is sellable. A known good die to any given person is a sellable die. Good is a sliding scale depending on how uh, um, allowing your market segment is for failures, what your margin looks like, what your average selling price looks like. It's a combination of all of those things. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's hard for the industry together to talk about this combined factor of good. However, sellable is black and white. I have defined a certain set of metrics. I have defined a product stack. Will this die in its given state that was delivered to me or that I generated myself create a sellable final product. And, and ultimately that's the measure of good when it comes down to um, creating a heterogeneous integrated package because you're never gonna get 100% yielding. It's not gonna work. There are millions of bits in DRAM. There are thousands of you know, non-redundant transistors in any given single IP tile, right? So ultimately you have to know, can I harvest that? Can I reconfigure the device? What, what do my end states look like? Will this die make it there? And then, you know, I'm willing to pay for it, depending on what the, uh, the cost is and, and how often we believe that's going to happen, which are, to me, measures of merit. They're never going to be a, a solid absolute number. Dave, you want to weigh in? Definitely. <laughs> I, uh, I could have said exactly what Bob and Mike did. Um, and in fact, I wrote down some of the same thoughts to myself. Um, I think no good die is an impossible dream. However, I think known good die itself is a very important concept. For the industry, I think we need, you know, the impossible dream. We have to be seeking a term or a, a tech, a, an ability, uh, a quality level. And known good die is, is it, in my opinion. Now, in a practical sense, um, I don't like not known bad. Uh, I would prefer known usable which I think is what Mike was saying. Yep. But in terms of a, of a need or a term for the industry, known good die is as good as it can get. Li Hong, anything to share? Yes, and uh, I agree all those, uh, you know, the opinions and, uh, you know, a very good comments, but uh, look at our position because uh, AAC is uh, packaging assembly and uh, suppliers. So it's very critical for us. And we receive the buyer die and the chip. We put that into the package to deliver the full product and are asking for full functionality. So the non-good die for us, we would we hope we want to have you know, the full, uh, fully tested and fully function, have a fully good functionalities. But I agree everyone's you know, opinions and how to we quantify it and use a number. And use a number we can, we can do, we can put on into the substrate. So that is very critical. 
So now good that for us, we want to be 100% fully functionalities before we put it into the package, but it's very difficult to achieve. For example, you know, people always chasing us, what's your final yield? You know, chasing us provide very high yield, like a 99, for example, 98. But without the good dye and the functionality dye and the fully texted dye put it into the substrate and put it into the board, it's very difficult for us. So we want really have, you know, like IDM over the system, uh, uh, you know, uh, the integrators to really to come out some numbers, like for example, PPM over zero, you know, defective dye. So I like, you know, I like said, you know, ser uh, a set of, uh, uh, you know, ser uh, serable dyes over, you know, over non-good dye, but for us, we really want to have the really meanings good dye and a full functionally dye. That's what our definition. Uh, Sabu, anything? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, if you think about today's systems, right, they're incredibly complex, massive, massive scale systems, right? And uh, the, the concept of what is a known good dye or a known good dialect is, is actually a very different concept nowadays. In the sense that it is impossible to test a bare dye, okay, to any degree. And number two, rework, okay, which used to be something that was possible in classical packaging is impossible today, right? I mean, if you think about interposers, if you think of the silicon interconnect fabric, if you think of all these new techniques that we're pushing, even, even fan out wafer level uh, packaging, rework does not exist. And so it is incumbent, I think, on, on for the system designer, okay, or the module designer to be willing to work with non-perfect dyes, right? Look, society does it. We have non-perfect people. You know, some of them are more non-perfect than others, but, uh, but you know, society can, can manage it, right? I mean, human beings, okay? Not all parts of our bodies work. We still function. So why must in complex smart systems that we're designing today require known good dye? We should be able to work with reasonably okay dye. So it's reasonably okay if your phone, your smartphone doesn't work? Well, see, that actually is, no, I didn't say that. I said the guy who designs this phone should be able to tolerate a certain amount of defectivity or functional thing, either through redundancy or algorithms or something of that sort, right? I mean, uh, so I think, I think it's not, the onus is not on making a die perfect. That is not going to happen. It's going to raise the cost and it's probably impossible to do. Yeah, and your there are parts of your phone which probably don't work. Don't there work exactly. Maybe, <laughs> maybe missing pixels out of the camera. There could be some bad pixels on the display. Maybe some of the memory locations are worn out. Uh, I would guarantee you the DRAM inside of it has defects that have been patched around. Um, it, we build systems today that typically contain billions of transistors. And part per billion failure rates are the norm for devices. I, I think something else that's happening that plays into how we change the way we're thinking is we do have device wear out. As we've moved to these very, very fine geometries, um, devices will die within the usable lifetimes of devices. So we better, you know, get on the ball and start figuring out not only how do we make the part good when it leaves the factory, but how do we continue to make the part good in the field? Um, your cell phone, it'd be really disappointing a month after you buy it if the DRAM gets another bad bit and it dies and it, you have to have it repaired or replaced. If that becomes the norm, um, you're not gonna sell new cell phones. And we are moving down a path where that will be the norm unless we do the same thing that I'm uh, saying that we need to do with the, the initial assembly. We, we need to move that all the way through the lifetime of the product. So from cradle to grave, you have repair, redundancy, self-test, self-repair capabilities. And this is like Subaru was saying, 
if you think about humans, the vast majority of us, mm -hmm. you know, survive in the world. We're not all identical. We have various defects. You know, I have some glasses. I'm a little bald. You know, missing a couple of teeth, but I still manage to function and move forward. Um, we need to treat electronics that same way, and it's it, it is a cradle to grave methodology, and as uh, Michael was saying earlier, you know, we buy processors today. And it's not that AMD or Intel or any of the other manufacturers build 40 different kinds of processors. They build a few different kinds of processors and they bin them based on speed, performance, how many cores are working, how big the cache memories uh, you know, came out, how much of those are. I have to jump in. I, 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 I disagree with Subu on, on one of the things he said, and I think we're, we're missing an opportunity. Um, while I agree strongly that we need resiliency in the design, uh, we need to be able to recover for problems. Um, I'm seeing more parts integrated with, say, 50 ICs on a substrate that I think we need to take advantage of the low-hanging fruit. And specifically, singulated dye testing is possible, is being done. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you just think about the assembly defects of thinning and dicing being in the 1% range or so, 1% on a 50 dye integration is going to give you really bad yield on the final assembly. I think we have to do what we can to find the chips, the cracks, prior to putting them all together in a, in a large assembly, or we're going to have problems. So um, no good dye is fine, but let's get the low-hanging fruit also. So let, let me take objection to what you just said. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, let's, let's say, you know, uh, one of the things that is happening is we're going to finer and finer pitch yeah. interconnects, Definitely. right? So today, right, at UCLA, we build wafer scale systems. When I say wafer scale, we're still at, you know, our, our facility is a four inch facility, 100 millimeter facility. So we can put something like 500 to 600 dialects, okay, on a single wafer. And the pitches that we have, okay, of the pads on those dialects is in the neighborhood of two to 10 microns. So when you come up with a way to probe a million plus contacts, okay, let me know. Cost effectively. I'll, I'll, buy you the first, <laughs> I'll buy the first one. <laughs> Cost effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Dave. Till I, then, I, I would love uh, to till have then I'll soon. go with my approach. Okay. I, I didn't say so I do. that we have to probe all those bumps after dicing. I said we have to test the device after dicing and do what we can to get the low hanging fruit, i.e., the parts that might have the chips out of the way so that you have a prayer of doing assembly at two microns. Good luck. Well, it, I, I, there I has to be a balance. You, you, I don't think Subo is saying you never test. I think that it always comes down to the economics of it. You're going to look at the cost of tests versus the cost of the assembly and the failure rate. Um, it, this, is, this is always the case. We do the same kind of things that Subo do, different mechanisms and whatnot, but I have the same problem. But I do assemblies that have things at a variety of scale. They, they incorporate normal flip chips. Some of them are wire bonded. And then we have other things that have, you know, micron scale assemblies. Well, I, there is no million channel tester. And, you know, you can't get there from here for all sorts of reasons. But it doesn't mean I'm to be stupid. If I can buy a known good flip chip die, I'm going to buy that because it's cost effective to do that. So whenever you can, you need to get the known good die or you know, functionally verify it at whatever level you can. Um, there is no one size fits all. In a, a variety of groups that I participate in, uh, there's uh, the NASA NEP guys who uh, look at this. And we have hashed through the 50,000 different ways you can do two and a half and 3D assembly. 
And we have yet to find a way to spread the peanut butter that covers all the possible combinations. It, uh, th there are no one rule that will always work. We're going to have to step through this. Um, I, I think you kind of end up with a menu of these are the technologies that we're going to incorporate into this assembly. And among those technologies, we can do Nonga Dai for these. These testing breaks it more than not testing. And we have that problem um, on some of our parts. We talk to the customers. We have to do very special um, sacrificial type pads and whatnot if people want to probe because when they probe the dye, they induce defects that affect yield. And so there's another evaluation in there. Did the test actually make things better or worse? So you, you have to go through these different combinations. Bob, that's so, a good point about balancing the scale. Um, I, I would like to challenge Subu, though, if I could, just a touch. Um, high power devices, I think, are a special world. And, you know, if you have a one, two, 500 watt die, um, his old company has published some really good data that suggests at a wafer probe, you really can't make good thermal contact to the back of the part. You certainly can't do thermal control. Um, I, I maintain that in order to, to handle that or to get a known good die of a high power type, you got to do it at the singulated die level. Is, do you have another trick up your sleeve for your two micron part if it's consuming 200 watts? Yeah, but uh, there is a, 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 there is no uh, two micron part that consumes 200 watts. Not <laughs> yet. <laughs> and yeah. I think uh, our, the whole concept of dialects is small dialects, right? We're talking about one square millimeter to 10 square okay. millimeters, right? And, uh, you know, big chips sink ships. So you don't want to go big, okay? You want it to be small. And the whole concept of dyes being good actually increases as you make the dice smaller. And this is a very important concept, okay? So I know that like, for example, right? NVIDIA wants to make 826 square millimeter dies that are mounted on interposers that are two reticle fields. Completely wrong approach, okay? What do you need to do? And they're all GPUs. It's the same darn thing repeated a million times. Make them smaller and connect them at fine pitch. And these things will work like a charm, okay? Once you get to anything below 100 square millimeters, yield is almost one, okay? I have That's to disagree with that. I have to disagree <laughs> with that because all you're doing, all you're doing, all you're doing is trading logic area for interface area and those interfaces normally are untestable you can make ah. them repaired you can increase area but all of a sudden you've you've created an environment where sure your wafer yield is perfect you have the ability to harvest things are nice and repeated but now i have millions of interconnect that can't be touched and can't be tested until that final integration is done so, so your your parts per billion becomes or your parts per million becomes an interface issue as opposed to a logic transistor issue so, so Michael, that is true if you are using complex 30s to communicate or very complex IOs. The beauty is that if you go to, like, do you test the connections between two blocks on your SOC? By you, default. They, they, they're the good. fact that I power it up, the fact that I power it up and yeah. run a scan X test environment means yes. Exactly. Yes, and what happens? And what happens if it doesn't work? I harvest it. <laughs> <laughs> My point exactly. <laughs> yeah, but he's not yeah, doing but, two, I mean, when you're, two millimeter parts, Subu. Cur well, yeah, it's actually much smaller than that at the, at the wafer scale integration level. But no, the, the, the issue is you, you're introducing a defectivity generation step with assembly. Even wafer level fan out as clean as it can possibly be will create defects. And your target area for those defects is growing the more chiplets you create. But the dimensions, okay, if you talk about, say, for example, a silicon process, we're talking about, say, you know, 500 nanometer type of connections versus two micron connections, okay, the defectivity is a heck of a lot less, okay? It's not zero, but it's acceptable. So, so I'd like to jump in and make a point because it's real relevant to this discussion, I think. 
I think what we're talking about, the issue is not testing. The cell phones are gonna work. The final package, we know how to test thoroughly. The issue is yield. Are we gonna get there and get 40%, 60% yield? And, and, and that's the main concern. It's not knowing how to test. And it might, because the concern is you put together some relatively poor quality known good dye, we can test it thoroughly at the final assembly and most of them fail. So, I, so Phil, you're, you're saying it, it's, it's this, you know, you, you, you can, you can screen out the failures. It's just going to cost you a lot to get there is such that it may not be practical. Yes. So it's a yield issue, not a test issue. Yeah. yeah and, and what I would, that, that's from the old IBM days of throwing it something over the wall to the other team. Yeah, I want to jump in, you know, regarding because uh, what we are talking about here is the yield and the cost. That is the end result. I truly, you know, agree, fail, you know, for us and everyone chasing the yield. Yield is the cost. So we are having to touch a little bit on the right now, you know, talk about the larger die or cut a small die, make, you know, multiple die integration, for example, chipless, heterogeneous integration. And those kind of things make the non-good die test the capabilities and also the functionalities become more challenging. For example, like uh, Mike Afan also mentioned about, you know, some die to die if you want to put together and they cannot be testable. And you have to put, the, put into the substrate or into the final or the 2.5D type of interconnect. And finally make this two die can be testable. But and who eat this kind of the yield loss due to the buyer wave for chips, the, you know, the functionalities. So that is a very challenging part. And uh, for us, and we also want to hear uh, everyone's you know, comments and uh, how we improve that for the testabilities. And not even after put into the package, in, it's too late if 40% yield. And that is a high cost. And, yeah, and in addition to that, I think, you know, Sabu and Bob, you talked about it, but there, there's, you know, let's say memory and FPGAs and GPUs have a lot of redundancy in the circuitry. So you lose a few, quote, cells, it's not a problem, you map them off. But, you know, you, I look at some of, let's say, the CPU cores, uh, well, you might have a multi-core CPU, and there was a three three core CPU product sold, which was a, a four core with a non-yielding core, but we won't go into that history lesson. No, we design but, triangles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's what the logo means, right? Okay, got it. Um, so, but there's still, we, we can't all be the space shuttle where there was three CPUs and they always voted. So if you've got to have more redundancy, let's, let's say you have to have double redundancy, then your, your node shrink, you might as well have built in the old technology because the same functionality per square area, once you put the redundancy of the circuitry in, it seems to be so, a, a cost trade-off. No, no, that, but, that is, that is absolutely, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Let me make one point and then I'm going to answer your question, Ira. I, I want to make a point with what Subu was saying. Uh, if we have an 800 square millimeter die or we have 80 10 square millimeter die, if I say the interconnect is perfect, they have the same yield if we don't test. It doesn't matter. It's the cumulative area of untested die that dictates the yield unless you're only going to pick die from the center of the wafer or something like that. No, so no, that, no, 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 that's yeah. not true. Uh, 800 die and, and uh, 800 millimeter dies do not have the same yield, sorry. They, uh, they have the same fundamental yield. As no, no way. Yes, they do. No, how can that be? It's per square millimeter. Mm -hmm. We can have this argument. No, 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 no. <laughs> overall yield, overall yield. It's That's per square millimeter. It's per square millimeter. Because but, the yeah, Bob, Bob is saying, Bob is saying, if I have 800 millimeters squared of silicon versus 800 millimeters squared of 10 millimeters squared silicon, and I need all of them to work, and I don't test anything, that final substrate yield will be identical. 
No, no, but that's not, that's not a fair comparison, okay? Because I have other approaches to make the smaller dyes yield. Yes, and that's fine. I, I just wanted to point out, you have to use other approaches. To answer Ira's question, the, the difference is, Ira, is that we generally don't build things today with one processor, so therefore we have to now build two. We build things with eight processors, so instead we make nine. Or we build something with a billion bits of memory, and so we make a 1.05 billion bits of memory. So you don't have to double it. And let me play into the point of heterogeneous integration. Um, what we can do, which pushes all of this much further ahead is, geez, why don't we build memory in a memory process and build processors in a processor process, you know, a high density logic process, and we'll build the RF in an RF process. We can customize the process to the element we're building and therefore we get a better yield. Rather than trying to build an SOC with 75 different layers of material in it, where each one has a yield loss, if we break it up so that we're now building 10 ICs in 20 layer processes, the fundamental yield does go up, and therefore my first assertion that all things being equal, the yield is equal, isn't true you do get better yield because fundamentally a better yielding die to begin with. I think what this all gets back to is we have to look at the problem differently and breaking the die up allows us to have other avenues to improve things. Um, there are other things you can do by building, you know, network on chip to provide you repair redundancy. What the processor industry has done, what the FPGA guys have done, the memory guys, I, we need to be applying those at, uh, with most of the chips that we're building, with SOCs. Um, that's seldom done today. I wouldn't say it's not done at all, but it's at least seldom done today. I'm absolutely sure that AMD thinks through this because they have lots of experience at doing um, doing this. How do I build redundancy? How do I select the processes for my die to make it the most cost effective? And that cost effectiveness is what is the geometry? What is the repair redundancy? What is the assembly cost associated with it and ultimate yield? And so re related to this, and I, I want to work in some of the audience questions. Um, so um, Suresh is asking, uh, AMD, Xilinx, and others have been doing SOC disaggregation, basically what you are just talking about, Bob, for many years and successfully in volume. What are the takeaways from their experience that are applicable and relevant to heterogeneous integration? So I think you were talking about a little bit about that as you, you build each building block in the heterogeneous integration in the most appropriate technology. Uh, are there other things that, you know, when you, you break apart the functionality of these huge chips that we, we benefit from this approach? Well, there's, uh, there's definitely benefits for looking at the IO that you have. When we do uh, two and a half D integration or three D integration, you change the IO structures. And I know Subu does this with his, his chiplets. You know, you don't have to have uh, a human body mile, uh, model um, ESD protection when you're doing 2.5D or 3D assembly in at least some of the processes like ours. So um, that affects the overhead with the I.O. Um, if I'm going to build 25 gig 30s, I'd really like to do that maybe in 7 nanometers. But uh, if I'm building RF, uh, or analog A to D converters or a lot of things like, I probably want to go to a larger process. So I think the heterogeneous integration um, is uh, a key aspect to really delivering the yield. Um, transistor matching with FinFETs is, um, is beyond an art. It, it, it's uh, you need to tune things to death. It's probably 
just a, a bad idea to be building high performance analog and FinFET processes, especially small FinFET processes. It takes too much space. It, it is wasted silicon in so many different ways. Um, you want to build that in a large geometry, maybe a 65 or a 130 nanometer process. Maybe it's a SIGI process. Um, we have to look at different avenues of optimization, uh, optimization that can be done. I'd like to Just jump in real question. quick, and I, and I do think since AMD was mentioned, Mike needs to comment. But um, <laughs> you know, the, the one common denominator I've seen, and Bob actually alluded to this before we actually took this question, is we need a known usable interface between the devices. I think the problem has shifted a little bit. Now we have you know, two devices, a, 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 a wide bandwidth memory needing to talk to an, an ASIC of some nature. And somehow we have to be able to uh, switch in different modes because the packaging, the substrate, reliability, consistency, or, or yield may not be there. So I think the known good die now becomes a known usable interface, in my opinion. Mike, comments? Uh, actually, I'd like to answer Suresh's question from a slightly different angle. Um, the, the most, um, I guess, uh, influential takeaway from working in disaggregation of dye, and I said this 10 years ago during some test vision conference that we were at, is it's communication. And that is, as you split the responsibilities of your device that used to be solely owned by an SOC integration organization, you're splitting it across multiple design teams, potentially across your company or in multiple companies. And this concept of understanding requirements versus capabilities and communication for those specific components is critical to the final success. You actually have to really kind of think about what you want your final product to look like, what the inputs and outputs are of every box. There is no real quick switch change, go talk to, to Tom because he can go swap out that, uh, that uh, speed path with this specific specialized you know, random logic macro. It, that, that doesn't work when you're doing heterogeneous integration. You actually have to plan and you have to be significantly more open in your communication to your customers, but even within your own organization, what used to be siloed should need, you know, needs to be uh, uh, kind of shown to the world, uh, you know, daily uh, integration uh, meetings, catching up on what your requirements are, are there any problems, you know, run fast, fail fast, these, these are, you know, and fix it and go. Um, these are the kind of the, the takeaways that need to be driven into our industry that's usually very closed when it comes to this type of communication. And, and so that actually was what happened with HBM, right? In JEDEC, AMD, when we were doing HBM, was very open about the fact that we don't trust you will make known good die. Let's start using the term known good after repair. I need repair for cells. I need repair for arrays. I need repair for the IO. I will take some penalty in order to create an interface that's slightly wider than I think it needs to be because I want you to be able to deliver me a functional device at the end of the day. And, and that type of open communication is, is the biggest way we're going to get the industry to move forward with heterogeneous integration. So, so, so like, what? So, Ira, sorry, Ira. I think Michael makes a good question, which brings up a good broad point, which is how is the industry going to evolve? In 10 years from now, are we going to be able to buy no good die for a lot of different components and mix and match and put them together? Or is heterogeneous integration just going to evolve with small clubs? That my company works with two or three other companies. We do all the stuff Michael just talked about and we work together and it works, but it's not some open eco ecosystem where you can just off the shelf buy no good die. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a, a combination. I think there's gonna be industry standard chips that have industry defined interfaces where that communication happens over the course of seven years <laughs> of, of JEDEC uh, discussions back and forth where people get to randomly vote. And I think it's gonna happen a lot faster with. Uh, close knit organizations where you've got a special black box IP that I want and we're going to work together to figure out how to slam it into the next product. And I've got two years until that happens. So let's go. So HPM is a good example where I, I would say it has worked or it is slowly, but it's kind of working, but HPM's relatively simple. Right. Maybe moving okay. yeah. onto the package. Now let's do high speed analog mixed signal parts next to an SOC. I'm not sure how the industry is going to evolve. If you look at 7400 series logic, 
back in the 70s and yeah. 80s. I was going to go to the dips. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it evolved. Not everybody had the same pinouts and whatnot when they started. They, it, there was a synergy. So if you look at some selection of chiplets being the equivalent of 7400 series, there will eventually be industry cooperation on some of those. But not every chip was, I, I couldn't slap an op amp from National Semiconductor onto a flip-flop part from Texas Instruments. They didn't have the same interfaces. But you're going to have, and I agree with Michael, that you're going to have this combination of some clubs. Um, there will be certain components. Probably memories will become standardized, memory interfaces. The memory industry is really good at working with itself and you know high volume applications to drive that. I think we're going to end up gluing stuff together. I imagine there's going to be um, a cute little chiplets that are nothing more than um, little gear boxes that allow chip A to talk to chip B because unfortunately yep. they were designed by the same company. Tra translators, um, yeah, I, I agree, they're going to come. And I, we've already looked at doing them. And doing uh, very, very, very tiny chips, sub one millimeter uh, square chips to do translators. Yeah, I so, want to, yeah, sorry, I want to jump but, in and uh, this is a very good uh, discussion since we touch, you know, the standard, uh, standardized interface. So we talk about, yes, HBM right now is kind of a successful uh, example and, but Talk about like uh, Michael and also the IDM OEM company. How about the ASIC interface design? Because right now, everyone now this is a kind of IP, and you can open you know for certain uh, you know interface. Do you think in the future and uh, like you are company like a design kind of a standard interface which uh, everyone can grab and to buy the standard chips and put together and this is the open uh, you know interface. I know there is the uh, OCP, maybe everyone now, open computing uh, project, you know, they try to work in uh, interface, especially on the standardization. But what we see here, majority of the open interface, for example, is on the connections, you know, like the USB is over, you know, some data center rack, this kind of very high level uh, open standardization of interface. But how about your IC, your ASIC design? And do you consider that is the direction you will open for the interface for everyone can be accessible? I fear, I remember a Star Trek episode where Data says, I think he's thinking two dimensionally. I think we need to start thinking three dimensionally also here. Um, you know, if we're talking multi die integrations, they're not just 2D. Yeah, I agree. Yes, uh, we talk about the horizontally, you know, like a 2.5D over 2D, 2.1D, and also the 3D, you know, the stack up. Yeah. Different answers, uh, I think, I fear, especially if you talk thermally. Right, and, and actually build on what Li Hong was saying, and we had a question from her in the audience. I mean, today, let's say HBM is the interface between the the chiplets or the the die standardized enough that you can let's say if you have a 32 gigabyte stack you can just switch to 64 mic and away you go without having to redesign the whole rest of your system or, or is there going to be enough standardization or let's say when you're going from a 4g baseband processor to a 5g baseband processor can you just swap it out and not really change the whole rest of your design or it, it, right now is everything back to square one when, when, when you want to upgrade a subsystem. Do, do you want the pie in the sky, impossible dream slash Dave Armstrong type uh, answer, or do you want the <laughs> realistic answer that we've seen from the past uh, experiences? What, what, what's the range from the experience to the desire? <laughs> I mean, so, so, so the pie in the sky answer is, yeah, it would be absolutely amazing if I could design chips that I could just swap out cores and get a, get, you know, get a, a system that has a certain set of IO infrastructure that doesn't need to change better performance from its, from its cores. 
Um, and, and, and there are, there are ways we can play those games and they, but they require a lot of planning and a lot of pre-planning about where features are going to develop. The more, the more realistic answer is if 4G and 5G are in the same process technology or in process technologies that can handle the same voltage ranges, you can swap them in if you can make them footprint compatible. But when one wants 1.6 and the other wants 1.3, we don't have an, a, an, a packaging infrastructure that can allow that communication to happen. So either you put in a 3D integrated voltage level shifter or some gearbox chip like Bob was talking about, um, but you can't just directly mate them. So that concept of I got to split, added a little overhead, and I got this magical product becomes I got to split, added this little overhead, added more overhead, now I have a product that can work, and how often are you going to be doing that? Is, and how long is that socket in the world going to be worthwhile? Is, is a discussion that is very uh, specific to the company and the market segment that they're in. Yeah, so but it can Michael, happen. Uh, it does yeah, happen, we do do it. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that concept, right, of translatorships or utility die, as we call them, I think it's a very good concept. For example, so you could have essentially a utility die, which is a very dinky little die. I mean, it could be, it doesn't have to be very big. I mean, almost negligible in size. That essentially takes any chip and translates it to a standard that can be used on that specific substrate. And if no translation is required. It's a dummy chip. It just passes through. Right. And that's, like I said, that, that's a way to go through it. But you're now taking additional clock steps, additional buffer steps. So the functionality will be achieved, but the performance gain might not. Right. So you have to play the game of what, what are you trying to sell? Are you trying to sell functionality? Are you trying to sell performance? Are you trying to sell the best combination of both? And how does that impact your overall product? I, I think the I think the performance per cost will indeed be very, very attractive. Because I, I, do, you, I agree with you there. The majority of the world will lean towards performance per cost, but there is also key players in the industry sure, that will sure. pay any yeah, cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those are the people that you want to court because they provide you the highest, you know, average selling price of your product. If the, if the package is like a, a printed circuit board, I'm, I'm going to assume that you have to redo it when you do new product launches, you have to refresh it time, from time to time. As, yes, package, yes. I'm talking more about silicon compatibility, the die compatibility. Well, and, um, I think that pre-planning, so I, I don't have to change the, the substrate, is probably not a worthwhile endeavor. No more than I would build a printed circuit board and say, I'm going to put all these extra translators in there because someday I might want to put in a 4G chip rather than a 3G chip or a 5G instead of a 4G. So I'm going to put an FPGA in between the two devices because someday I might want to do that, but today it doesn't do anything. I, you wouldn't do that. Um, I think that if if we if we back off to um, one of the benefits of using chiplets is I don't have to redesign the whole system every time. I don't have to make a three hundred million dollar investment in my next chip. Instead, I can make a ten million dollar packaging investment, and I'm going to make another twenty million dollar investment in a special two or three chiplets to go to the next step. If we go down that road, I think that's much more realistic. It also allows the industry to not just be two companies. If there is going to be a future to this electronics industry, we have got to make the fundamentals of building semiconductors and building electronic products something that can be measured in million dollar chunks, not hundred million dollar chunks. And I think a lot of the effort that's going on with the, uh, the ERI and how do we see, how do we re-enable, reinvigorate an electronics industry actually plays into this two and a half and 3D assembly. Um, if I can buy 98% of my chip in off the shelf chiplets, even if I have to put some rubber cement between them in the form of translators, it is probably way more cost effective than building a brand new $300 million SOC because I can actually maybe sell that to a small number of customers. Um, Marvell at some level does this by having combinations of chiplets for some of their microcontrollers. Um, 
we, I think, um, well, I'm probably flogging the dead horse and there's lots of questions, so I'll shut up. <laughs> so actually though, Bob, I think you, you mentioned a good thing. I mean, it depends what business you're in. If your business is selling microcontrollers, you, you wanna have enough functionality to, to have the largest possible customer base. And you probably wanna watch your investment but if you're somebody like Apple, you know, where they, they build hundreds of millions of the same unit, you know, they may, may, they may look at the cost of investing a new mass set. It's not, it's not non-trivial, it's certainly material, even at their financial scale, but their ROI is much higher. Well, the, I remember back in the 80s when Xilinx first came out, and there was this, how is this ever possibly going to make sense? It takes 20 gates to build one gate in the Xilinx park. At least in the 80s it did. It's probably even more now. Um, and the reality is, is Xilinx is very successful. What they said is, you know, 85% of all products ever built run less than 10,000 in volume. And we seem to have completely forgotten this paradigm. And the, the world now revolves around conversations where we all kid each other that everything's going to run a million in volume. And we lie to the foundries because they wanted us to tell them we're going to build 10 million of these widgets and therefore we need a good price on the per wafer and whatnot. And unless I'm Michael at AMD, I'm probably lying. Um, the reality is that still a lot of products run in low volume. Um, I think the, the electronics industry is in some ways doing, uh, the semiconductor industry, maybe not the electronics, is doing poorly because we haven't come to terms with a methodology to enable small startups, small businesses, businesses which address customers that need thousands and tens of thousands of parts rather than millions and tens of millions. Um, it, this has got to be true. If it wasn't true, Xilinx and Altera wouldn't be in business. They, there's got to be a, a market for lower volume products. So, so what um, we need, Bob, is a known good chiplet catalog. Yes, I, I, years ago, I, I have said we are going to end up, when you go to the ASIC foundry, you're going to say, this is what I want. I want, um, these memory devices and I want that A to B converter and uh, this processor element and it's going to be assembled onto uh, my interposer, my package, my substrate with this, my two million gate custom special sauce. And I, I believe I have, uh, for 20 years I've said that's the future. So, and it still is. <laughs> So, 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 Lee Hong, customers never mislead you as to the volume, their volume expectations? Actually, you know, for us, uh, just like I also see the audience has uh, questions, so maybe I just answer okay. you know, together. Yeah. yeah, so for our side, for as a sampling and a provider or supplier, we, yeah, we kind of in the middle, we call the middleman. So because we receive the buyer die, we call the non-good die, and we also deliver the full product. And for the end customer, they also call our product as a non-good die, basically. So, so turn out to be you know, what in the middle men or we need suppliers and uh, what uh, we, are, we are going to provide. The end result, like you said, high, high volume, high yield, low cost. Right, it's you know that's a conflicted, you know, low cost and high. Yield. Oh, and they wanted everything yesterday too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I just answer, you know, the audience, you know, ask what we are doing as our positioning, what we do better, you know, with a fund, a foundry, and what's a challenge also with a foundry. So I answer these questions. Okay, so the we doing so far, we have we doing very well. Uh, with the foundry and also with the system integrators like IDM, OEM, because uh, majority they provide their design, they provide their test coverage. And basically we just 
majority we following the test, you know, the instructions and uh, they own basically the test and they own the product design. So, and also Foundry provide the bare wafers based on the customer, their customer, uh, like a wafer sub specifications. So most of the time we are doing very well and we can provide high volume and with a very high, you know, uh, product yield. And also, you know, the reliability, you know, we pass all this kind of reliability tests. That is we're doing well for so far for most of the product because those product majority is like either you now single chip module or you know the uh, the foam factor is on the medium and on you know like a 55 60 by you know 65 those kind of body size and not the very complicated so so far but things changed everyone now more slow slowing and people talk about you know five nanometer seven nanometer talk about the diapathisney and to save you know the wafer yield so once you know heterogeneous integration comes out and the multiply, multiple multiple dye chipless integration, and for us is a lot of a challenge right now. So the two things I, I can list here, for example, if you put the heterogeneous integration, for example, the SIP to be in package, and the people talk about just now, you know, the one very big gen in the customer, they put thousands of components in one very small, like a 45 by 45 or 50, 42 by 52 two board, put the thousands of components there from the seed. So how we make sure all this, the components and coming good. And we also end the product after we assembly, we deliver with a very high yield, 99%. That is very challenging for us. So, so the first things for our side, we need to control the incoming, incoming component quality. Sometimes we have to do the screen. We have to do the pre, you know, pre, pre kind of a pre-run, risk run, just to make sure, you know, after put the salt in the product, you know, we're seeking very high yield. So, so this is, these things, you know, make us how to work with a foundry, different foundry and different, you know, component suppliers and how we deal with them, how to make sure they are delivering very good diet. So this is the challenge we are facing right now. Another one, for example, and if they pass you know, the wafer salt, but sometimes the latency defect in the wafer, and you cannot capture by just the, at the room temperature at the normal test, and you have to accelerate it. And that's why, you know, like reliability, that's why it comes out the reliability test. No one have talked talk about that. You know, re reliability test just a, just a screen out the latency defect, which you cannot capture by the wafer salt test. And also, you know, also, for example, and if everything you pass your wafer salt test, but it fail our, at the end of our assembling after we put everything together, then we do the failure analysis. We find out, oh, that is related to the silicon dye. It's not related to our assembling process. So then who will tag this, this yield loss? And, uh, and you know, we have several uh, cases that is not only like a fail, only one, two parts. It's a high, high, you know, high failure. And we bought the material, we bought the dye. And uh, it's obvious it's supposed to, you know, like uh, the foundry in supposed to drop this loss over IDM. It take a lot us, you know, for example, one case is take us like one year to resolve who will pay this. So, so this is the kind of the challenge we have and we will, we will, we feel and we already realize and moving forward and the, the challenges, you know, between the uh, assembling house or old size with the foundry, with the IDM, how we work together, how we ensure all these kind of things, you know, in parallel resolved and we can provide high volume, low cost and <laughs> product. So, 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 so lot, lot, lots of challenges there. And then, I mean, how do you, let, let's, I, I think we, we've talked about a, a lot in this conversation about the needs and ways of getting to future architectures. But, you know, if, if we get back to the concept, you know, or where we started this discussion about known good dye, or I, 
I, I sometimes want a different term, but let, let's call it die quality or what, whatever you want to call it. You know, we want to give Li Hong the best possible die to put together. You know, how, how do we make progress or have we made progress? I mean, one of the questions I still have in my head, you know, you call it known good die or you call it whatever you want to call. You know, if you test something and you say, yeah, it passes. And then you do things like thin it, singulate it, you know, is it still good? Or, you know, if, if what Li Hong is getting is dye as wafers, they're shipped as wafers, who's responsible for what happens to it when it gets thinned or diced? And if it's, quote, a dye failure or a test escape or something, I mean, there's just so many questions I have here that I don't think we can reliably ship singulated dye and large number of units safely. So are we just fooling ourselves that these wafers are good or known good substrates or? I think Bob made the point before and I think Subu, Subu touched on it as well. You know, it's a balancing act. Every time you touch a part, you risk hurting it, pure and simple. Every test, test step can hurt a device. So as a result, does the test add value? That's what we have to look at. If you can't get there and if you can't test a high power part with the right thermal paths in place any other way than singulated, then that's what you're going to do, in my opinion. If you can another way, probably it's preferable. And that's one thing to think about. Bob talked about buying chiplets out of a catalog, putting them together. To do this, if you have issues like you brought up, Ira, and they do happen, you need the whole test suite to come along with it. There's not the infrastructure or the vision today for how to do that, or even necessarily the supplier understanding that's a requirement that I need to deliver a chip, uh, an entire test suite along with the bare die. Oh, and it, the, 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 when the memory guys first were introduced to this comp concept of, I need you as the memory provider to give me nearest neighbor test patterns so I can screen your die in post test assembly. This was like, you want me to tell you what? I can't tell you that. You'll know all this stuff about my process. And my God, this is you the communication I was talking about. Yeah, it's, um, this is, uh, it was a huge hurdle. Um, it, you know, and I, I can tell you that uh, people have to get used to these things. Um, yeah. Do you think do you think HBM suppliers are doing that today? Are providing all that information? I don't well, think they're, provi I, they're providing a lot of it. I I would never go so far to say they provide everything. Michael can answer this question better than I can. Um, the HBM I, providers it, are providing a lot more information than they would have if this had been a DDR dim or a soldered down chip on a board. Um, it, it has been built in such a way that with the appropriate access to the device, the customer can actually back calculate what the wafer yield looks like. And that's how open it is. Yeah, and I can say that, you know, we do a lot of post-processing on wafers from many, many different fabs. And the vast majority of the fabs are uh, pretty transparent with their wafer assemblies. I mean, it's not like they send me their flow diagram for the fab but I can find out materials and layer thicknesses and a lot of things that would be in, they certainly wouldn't exchange with competitors. Um, people are going to be doing the assembly. And this is one of the reasons I don't believe that fundamentally the, the TSMCs and global boundaries and, you know, the people who have fabs, full flow fabs, are going to ultimately be the same people who do the assembly because you have to give too much information about your parts to a potential competitor. You know, when, when people would say, oh, TSMC is going to do this all, and I'd say, great, I want to be there at the table when TSMC asks Global Foundries for the process information for the wafers that they're sending for TSMC to assemble. I, I, I'm going to buy popcorn and, you know, just sit at the table and watch <laughs> this because it ain't going to happen, you know, nor do I think Samsung 
and Mike Braun and the other players are, are going to do that. I think packaging houses and companies that do two and a half and 3D assembly occupy a really unique position in the marketplace. I think AMD, which is now essentially fabulous, occupies a unique position in the market where they can garner information from their chip providers, their chiplet providers, that you and I could not conceive of being exchanged freely in the industry. Bob, I, I would question that the broad spectrum of data that you alluded to is really what's needed for a known good die. Uh, so I, I would question, you know, do, do you need doping, doping densities? Do you need, uh, uh, you know, uh, metal no. spacing data? What, what all do you need? Well, I think what you do is you, you find out sensitivities and it depends on what you're doing. We exactly. do a lot of 3D assembly. So we literally add additional metals onto the layer and I need to know some things about maybe the materials you have in that wafer in case I break it so I know how to decontaminate my equipment. Generally speaking, the fabs, if you give them a good reason why you need to know something, they will tell you the information. You know, they're, they're not trying to prevent a lot of this from happening, especially if it's a potential of a, of a high volume customer. I am sure that, you know, AMD can ask a lot of questions and get answers that I can't. You know, if I have a customer who's gonna buy 20 wafers, they're <laughs> more reluctant to provide some of the information than, you know, AMD, which was gonna buy, you know, buy 200,000. But I, I find them generally to be open about some of these things. Some fabs aren't. I, there are fabs I can't get wafers from, at least generally. Um, you know, I've had people show up with wafers, we do processing and they go away with the wafers after we're done. <laughs> um, you know, because they don't want you to know their yields or they feel that there's an instruction. But, uh, but I do think that um, there will be a growing realization among the people in the new ecosystem we're talking about that of, of a more uh, Open, there will, be, there will be a requirement for more openness about your fields. When you say it's a known good eye, what does that really mean? In your process, what are the failure mechanisms? If I toast the wafer for 300 degrees for an hour, should I expect there to be more failures? That's you know, in, you know, the memory guys have this problem. You know, they, they don't like to have discussions of where you're going to toast their wafers for extended periods of time because what they said was a known good die no longer is. You know, very, if, very you, true. if you'll forgive me a little uh, uh, plug here, in the heterogeneous roadmap right now, we have a team focused just on AI-based testing. And, you know, you, you mentioned the relevance of the data. Um, you know, perhaps AI tools is what we're going to use in the future. Maybe that's the pie in the sky thing that Mike keeps you know, alluded to before, but uh, the reality is, I think this is one of the places we're going to go to. I, I think that there's applications. AI is really good at pattern matching. I, I think, you know, that the tool set of the future is going to uh, look at the repairability of die and redundancy of interconnects and these kinds of things. And your CAD tool, you're going to plug all of these things into your substrate and it's going to spit out and say, yeah, you should expect the 97% finished yield on this after repair. Right now, I guarantee you AMD is doing this, but there, there's no nice, you know, tool from mentor cadence or synopsis that is probably sitting there and helping them. They just have there's a, a nice tool period. from AMD. <laughs> but we do not <laughs> <laughs> but with all your learning baked in. Um, we've got a lot of questions queued up. Um, is there any that you guys want to tackle first? Or we've got about uh, 15 minutes scheduled. We can run a little late, but I want to be respectful of the audience's time. Um, is there I heard just uh, to jump ahead to one, Herb Reeder is out there and asked about uh, cooperation between Wafer Foundry and Assembly House. And what we were just touching on, which is somebody like an AMD, it, I think the end customer has to drive everything, has to drive pulling the data, the test plan, 
the cooperation, collaboration. Um, and I'd welcome if somebody wanted to disagree, but I don't see, I think assembly houses, for example, will only do what they need to do or are told to do. And I think boundaries are, pay, are paid to do. <laughs> yeah, very good. And boundaries, um, I, I don't know we need that much more data or anything from foundries. Um, Foundries I, won't be driving the ship anyhow. It'll, I think the end customer has the control of this. I, I do think that it depends on the end customer and what the end customer experiences are. And I do think that the foundry could probably provide a service, be a charge or as an incentive to help customers that don't necessarily have fab experience. AMD is lucky in that sense. We were a fab company. We are no longer a fab company. So we have a lot of people that understand exactly the way processes work and have been keeping up to speed on the latest technologies and, and even farther on and then, you know, into three nanometer and two nanometer. Um, but I, I do believe that a customer that is not as readily cognizant of the different ways device physics can change and what has happened in the industry uh, from from process technology perspective could gain a lot from learning from a foundry of saying, you know, I understand your test plan. Here's the characterization ranges you guys should be looking in. This is what you should be expecting from from the things. I, I just don't I don't think the end customer always knows what they should set that final bar at. Yeah, it, it, they do that today um, when we would run you know, our memory devices, there would be questions about sensitivity. If they, when we're, when they're assembling uh, the key fleas or the getting the PCM data, what is something that affects our yield? We were a sophisticated, you know, company at Pezzeron as far as guiding that. And I agree a lot of the users maybe don't understand that. And that's really where the foundry has to speak up about you know, if you're going to do these post assembly processes, like whatever assembly process, you need to be aware that this maybe is something else that you should be checking. I, I think, uh, I think foundries have a lot of information that can help the process. I suspect a lot of foundries don't even know what they don't know. Um, ones that do some of it like TSMC today, with their own chip scale packaging and their own assembly, probably have already done a lot of rock breaking about, geez, we see kind of how these dots connect between what happens in the foundry and what happens during assembly. But that's an exception, not a rule. Guys, I, I, I hear what you're saying and I tend to agree that data is needed throughout the processing of the part, but as a test guy, a test vendor, isn't this just a test problem? I, I don't think so. I think this is a de definition of final product and how that is, how that can be impacted by every step in the process, not just test, ev everything. I do think test adds a lot to this, and I do think test will create a valid screen, but I would like to separate test and utilizing test equipment for device characterization. Those are actually two very different things. One sets the bounds, the other makes sure devices within the bounds. And so you want to make sure that you're looking, you know, these days in the latest process technologies, nobody knows the bounds. A product has to define it by its own, you know, where, where is its working window? And that's slightly different than test. It takes a little bit of a different knowledge. Set. Well, the only way you know the working window is through test. C I correct. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you don't use test, but I'm saying it's, I don't believe it's a test problem. Yeah, it test is a tool. I can't design quality. I, I can't test quality in. I can't test yield in. I need tests to make sure I have those things. But it, it's, it, is, it is part of the, the toolkit. But and let me add one more thing that I think Dave was hinting at, which is the whole data integration. If you're pulling together these chiplets from different vendors with different characteristics, do you just get the die and maybe you get a little bit about how to test it? Or are you told things about test information from that die? What was the wafer yield? What are the parametrics? And I'm somebody, and Ann Gattiger, or excuse me, Ann Meitzner asked about outlier characteristics. 
it would be cool to be able to see from the final product with these 10 chiplets, what the characteristics of each of the die were from wafer pro from the foundry through wafer probe through final test. But today, I don't think there's the infrastructure except at a few places, I'm sure. A I know AMD has a nice system probably for looking at, at whatever data they can get, but there's not a broad industry infrastructure for pulling all this, for, for passing the data along and then being able to analyze. Agreed. You know, and, and that's why I was highlighting that the, the, most, the, the most influential thing that this experience has taught us is communication. And I guess I should have added that communication and, you know, extremely strong partnerships, right? We, we work with them in the very beginning of all of our partners and we treat them like partners. Hey, we are going to make a product together. This is not an AMD product. This is a industry product of us working together. And we're going to provide you information. Here's a bunch of failing devices. We think it's your problem. You may not agree with us. Let's start working through this and having daily, daily deep dives and, and debugs. And, and so having that traceability, having that uh, ability to pass the data infrastructure on a more generalized basis would definitely speed this up. Um, but right now it is very, very homegrown. Yeah, I totally agree, you know, like uh, the partnership and the infrastructure. And here also, like, I agree the ownership, right? So the ownership, like uh, Michael, you said, majority, you know, you design, you know the product, you design the product, and then you come to all the specifications about the product for you know, thousands over millions, you know, product and sipping out. And also you put, you decided which kind of the, the chips you want to put together. So the ownership, you know, who will champion this infrastructure, the ownership, this first, second, the tools, yes, test, test the coverage and the test the suppliers and those are the one. And the, and the second one, I think, you know, all the manufacturing is like a foundry and like a assembly house, like old size. And so we need to work together, but who in this topic and who will be the owner for the key for ensure the end product will produce high yield? So do you think you know, the ownership should be from the system integrator or IDM or OEM? I, I think that it's important to also understand that we have a spectrum here of sophistication in the assembly that goes from having two chip, you know, two chips flip chipped onto an organic substrate to Subu's 80,000 chips on a 12 inch substrate. And the closer you are to Subo's, you know, perfect world, the more this is a team effort, as Michael is describing. You have to all work together. You can't just throw it over the wall and say, you have an assembly problem, go figure it out. That ain't gonna work. You, you don't have a product anymore. Um, you might be able to get away with that when you have a two chip assembly. You can pretty much say chip A seems to be the problem. Chip A vendor, go, you know, go fix this. Um, so I think we're an evolving world that as we get to that Subu side of the spectrum, um, you, you, this is a partnership. Either you all work together, you work towards one goal, we figure out how to solve it. And maybe the problem is in chip A, but maybe the answer is that we fix it in the substrate or we fix it in chip B or we do something else entirely. You know, and as you add in thermal issues and you add in you know, user environment issues, there are more and more facets to this. It is, it is a level of complexity that it's a team effort. I, I agree. And if, if you you know you want to see one of the best the best cases or best instances of co collaboration where collaboration is supposed to be extremely difficult, uh, go look up the KB Lake G product. Okay, so it is actually one of my favorite products in the instantiation of a heterogeneous integration. It is an Intel product, which sounds a little weird that I would like it, but it's a KB Lake processor with an AMD graphics processor and an HBM sitting on it as well, and it's right. into the market. Right? This is talk about talk about ways to partner with people that you don't normally communicate with, and opening yourself up to understanding what the industry or what your competitors are doing. That's that's the level of integration we're going to need if this is going to be ubiquitous. 
Um, so if it's Mike, going to just isn't... be an AMD thing, if it's just going to be an AMD thing or an Intel thing or a single house integration thing, we can, we can really limit the scope of some of these problems. But if it's going to be cross everything, that problem scope has to be, you know, defined as big as that is, which is the industry level. Sure. So, so, Mike, that isn't just a case to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> so, <it would> no, <laughs> <laughs> no, that was actually a really cool product. Okay, good. Okay, um, I launched the poll. So, if everybody's still on the call, if you could take a moment to just uh, answer the questions really quickly, they're they're really simple. Uh, five questions that helps us get some feedback. Uh, we've got about five minutes left. Is there any? Anything any of you want to pull off the question list, and I have to apologize. There's four, far more questions than there's time. So if anybody wants to kick one of the questions into the discussion, let's just do that before we. Um, uh, actually, uh, I'll, I'll throw one in asking about 1838 for uh, help the ASIC for heterogeneous integration and limitations. I think we, we touched upon this test as a tool. 1838 gives you the access and the visibility into the stack. But does it really push us closer to known good die? Well, as I alluded to before, the, the challenge uh, when you do a heterogeneous integration is the communication infrastructure and the die to die stuff and the in the stack stuff. So obviously, uh, the more we're doing on in that front, the better off we're going to be. Okay. I'd like to answer. Uh, the the Theodore asked a question about uh, we've been discussing and working on known good die improvements for a decade, and more with uh, increasingly complex packaging being proposed and implemented into production. Could the panel comment on a semi quantitative way uh, on how far we have come in, in the areas and what needs further effort? And, and uh, you know, semi quantitative, of course, I'm not going to give you numbers, but um, I would say, you know, over the course of the past uh, 18 years that I've been at, at AMD, we have seen, you know, close to two orders of magnitude more control over the final. Uh, goodness, quote unquote, or sellability or usability or whatever term you want to use. Um, and, and it really has come down to, you know, what corner cases do I need to understand whether or not are worthwhile for me to ship or trash? And, and how, do I, how do I go across that? And am I going to be winding up creating a market segment to ship something that I have to then serve later on when the problem is fixed and I no longer have that compromised piece of silicon to, to, to fill it. So now I'm dumbing down working silicon to, to feed a, a, a bunk market segment. That was a great idea at the time. Um, I, I think those are all, the, I think that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, as a semi-quantitative way, you know, two, two orders of magnitude, you know, points of percents are now where we're looking to actually find uh, opportunity. I'm not telling you that that's where yield is, but I'm telling you that's where we're looking. Those are, those are the areas of opportunity that are left as opposed to tens of percents, which is what they were previously. I look yes, back over the enough. last decade and to me, uh, the progress, I, I got to look back to what we were talking about back in the beginning. And that was wafer, wafer stacking of high bandwidth memory devices and making products out of that. And that hasn't gone to come to fruition. On the flip side, however, we have been able to do known good stacks, known good die. HBM is a fairly mature environment. So I would say in a quantitative way, hey, we're up to nine levels, is it, of HBM stacking successfully in a reasonably good known good die. Um, 13. That's a far cry from <laughs> 50 die on a substrate that we need to get to. We've done actually with, 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 with HBM 2E, you will have significantly more than 50 die on a package. I know yeah. you will. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are packages that I have at least seen proposed that have over 200 die. Lots of members. How do we manage Lots that of members. God. Repair redundancy. You, you, it, there an go. immense amount of that die, uh, of those die, you can heal large sections of it. Sure. Now we got to test the redundancy though, by the way. 
Yeah, and, and you, uh, yeah. <laughs> is, a fail, is a failure in your DFT logic a failing device, or does it still work? Yeah. Uh, I think that could be a topic for yet another discussion. So. Sounds like a tee up for the uh, conference. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Ira. I, I had trouble coming off mute before, but there was a question about 1838. That's 1838 to me looks like a very nice solution for like multiple SOCs or ASICs or even processors, digital processors. Most, almost, well, actually, all the products that I know about that are doing this heterogeneous integration that I'd call it, um, unfortunately, are not that. There are things like DRAM which are not 1838 or analog, uh, putting an RF chip, you know, different. It's just not, it's not gonna broadly solve a lot of the, the interconnect testing issues for the products at least that I've seen. Depends upon the class of the product. Um, there are so many great other questions there, but I'm looking at the time and I think we are now at the, the 90 minutes. So wanted to thank everybody for engaging in the panel. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for attending. I'd like to thank all of you for expressing your views and hopefully uh, helping uh, drive this discussion in a meaningful way. I'd like to encourage people to stay in touch. Um, and participate at the upcoming Known Good Die workshop September 16th. We'll send out information. Everybody who registered to this uh, webinar will get an email with the link to the video. And I'm sure, I, for, uh, speaking for everybody on the panel, if you reach out to any of us, I'm sure we'd be interested in continuing the conversation with you. And uh, certainly I think it is a meaningful discussion as to how we help drive the industry forward because as we all can see life is getting more and more complex and uh, the packaging technology is going to continue to drive in that direction so with that i would like to thank everybody and uh, say goodbye and i wish everybody the good remainder of their day thank you thank you thank you